I want to welcome uh, everyone that's here at our iTech Auditorium, but I also want to welcome everybody who's considered a VU friends and family, whether you're watching by way of YouTube or listening to the podcast. We're so grateful for your participation. Maybe you're not here locally in Miami, but you are a part of this place, and we're praying for you, and we're grateful for your contribution. Uh, this evening, we are kicking off a brand new collection of talks entitled Restless, Finding Rest in the Stress of Life. And on one hand, I'm really excited because I really believe this is a word for our community, but I also believe that this is a message that's far greater than just our local community. I think this is a message that our culture, our society needs, that, that people need to discover the peace of God in a new way. And for the next four weeks, I'm going to challenge you. I want you to be a part of this collection. I'm excited to share with you some things that I believe from the Bible that are going to help you and refresh your soul. But tonight, to kick it off, I want to just direct your attention to two simple little scriptures. It's Matthew chapter 11, starting in verse 28. These two little scriptures, I think, are quite profound as we read them. It says this. These are Jesus' words. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is is light. And tonight, as we kick off this first week of our brand new collection, I, I titled tonight's message, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Still haven't found what I'm looking for. Would you pray with me tonight as we study God's word? Lord, we thank you so much that you brought us here. We thank you, God, for what you're doing in our midst. We open up our hearts. We open up our soul that you might speak to us in a clear way, in a fresh way, in a new way. God, we want to leave here tonight experiencing your rest. We know that you can do it. We know that you will do it. And if you agree with that prayer, come on, all of God's people said? Amen. Come on, all of God's people said? Amen. Come on, if you love Jesus, make a little bit of noise, 5 p.m. fire. You know, I was thinking this morning that um, I got out of bed this morning because I wanted something. I wanted a lot of things, to be honest with you. The first thing that I wanted is I got out of bed this morning because I wanted to go to the gym uh, I've learned that working out, the older and older that I get, it's, it's less about my physical body and it's more about my mind. That when I'm working out, it's anchoring my mind to the present, that it's engaging me for the day that is ahead. Uh, I, I woke up this morning, I got out of bed this morning because I, I actually wanted to wake up before the wrath and the will of Wyatt Wesley Wilkerson began. <laughs> Please, this week, if you have some time, pray for Don Shree and I. We are four days away from Don Shree giving birth to baby number two. <laughs> We need your prayers. Um, I, I got up this morning because I, I wanted to come here. I, I wanted to see you. I wanted to be with you. I wanted to be in our community. I wanted to be encouraged by your faith. And I wanted to share my faith. And I wanted us to be sharper together. I think on a practical level, you know, I, I got up this morning because I, I wanted to come and do my job. For a lot of us, Sunday is like your seventh day of the week, which means it's kind of your rest day. But, but for me, Sunday is my Monday. Like this is my job, this is my work. And when I get up here and I get to share and preach, there's something quite fulfilling and satisfying when you feel like you're doing what you're called to do. I got up out of bed this morning because there was all sorts of desires that were motivating me. Have you ever noticed that desire is a huge motivator in life? And what's interesting about desire is that it begins at a very young age. My son, Wyatt, he's not even two years of age yet. In fact, he's 21 months. Now, I've heard about the terrible twos. Nobody told me about demonic possession 21 months. <laughs> this little boy, pray for me, right? I don't know what's going on. This kid all of a sudden found his will, and he is the boss of everyone. I can't keep up with how many personalities and emotions that he has in a three-minute span. He goes from crying to laughing to crying to laughing to yelling at me. I don't know what's happening. This little boy is hilarious right now. It's funny, before I was a parent, I used to think that babies, they cried because, because they were sad. Not true. Babies cry because they're angry. <laughs> what are they angry about? They're angry because many times they have a desire and you are stopping them from getting their desire. See, this whole idea of desire, it begins at a very, very young age that we want something. And desire is not bad, it becomes bad when the desire is no longer under your control. 
In fact, tonight, as we're kicking off this collection, I just have a really basic question that I want you to write down. I want you to pray about it. I want you to think about it deeply this week. Here's the question. Are you steering your desires or your desires driving you? Because so many of us are driven by desire. Think about maybe some of the most basic emotions. Many of them come from the root of desire. In the past, when you don't get what you want, the emotion that you have is that you're sad. In the present, when you get what you want, the surface emotion is you're happy. Uh, when somebody prevents you from getting what you want, please listen to this sermon, Wyatt Wesley Wilkerson, <laughs> your emotion is you get angry. But how about this? How about for the future, I might not get what I want. The emotion is I'm anxious. I'm, I'm anxious. I might not get what I want. Here's the point. The point is, is that when you are driven by your desire, it's only a matter of time before you break down. Why? Because desire grows. Desire increases. You think if you get more, you'll be happy. The only problem with that thinking is many of you, you've lived there. You've got more money. You've got more power. You've got more fame. Yet somehow every time you get there, you're like, yo, I need more to be happy again. It doesn't stop. The desire continues to grow. Desire is infinite. I love it how Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, Ecclesiastes chapter one, verse eight, he says, all things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What's he saying? He's saying, the more and more I get in life, the more and more I see, I just want to see more. The more and more I hear, I just want to hear more. The more and more I taste, I just want to taste more. More is not bringing me satisfaction. In fact, in the words of another great philosopher, I can't get no satisfaction. <laughs> Nobody in Wuhan even gets that joke, but pray for them. Why? Because it's like the carrot and the stick analogy in psychology. It's a trainer who has a horse and he puts a carrot on a stick and he puts the carrot in front of the horse. The horse can put out as much effort and as much willpower as the horse desires. But as long as that carrot is on the stick, the horse is never going to get it. Desire, when we're driven by it, leads us to breakdown. Why? Because we are finite. Desire is infinite. The result is restlessness. I'm finite, you're finite, but desire grows and it's infinite and it leaves me in a constant state of being dissatisfied. You don't have to be a great researcher and you don't have to be an incredible sociologist to look at the world today and realize that while there are many great opportunities for success, there are many obstacles right now that are leading towards our demise. Uh, anxiety is on the rise in our nation. Obesity is on the rise in our nation. Depression at an all-time high. People have never been more medicated in their entire lives. Suicide is growing. What's the reason for all of this restlessness? What's going on with humanity? Well, there's many things that we could begin to deconstruct, but one of the most simple things just to look at our society is our society is anything but simple. It's complicated. I mean, things are changing so fast. It's like you can get a degree today and in a couple of years, that degree could be obsolete because things have already changed. And people are trying so hard to keep up. And so people stay busy and people stay running and they stay striving and they're, they're nonstop, nonstop. But it's leading us to a place of distraction. I mean, I want you to know that our world preys on this idea of uncertainty and worry. They profit off of your worry. Just think about the media system for a moment. You do know that the news is giving you news based upon fear. If it bleeds, it reads. And I don't care if you swing to the left and I don't care if you swing to the right. You can go to Fox News or you can go to CNN, but both parties will tell you what to be afraid of, who to stay away from, who not to believe in, who's bad, who's good, and all it's doing is making us afraid. We're being driven by fear, but it's this fear that's leaving us in a place of anxiety. Think about marketing for a moment. They, they don't sell fear, they sell desire. Research now tells us that we see every single day 5,000 different advertisements. A day. A, I was pumping gas yesterday and there's a TV screen. I'm like, no, not here. This was my safe place. 
And what are marketers selling you? They're selling you that you, you should live this life and you should have this and you should have that. And if you get that house, you'll be happy. And if you have that kind of car, then you'll finally be satisfied. And if you go on that vacation and if you wear those clothes and if you look like this, if you suck this in, if you cut that, you'll look good. Yet what's happening is that we are distracted. We are confused. And because we're being driven by fear and desire, it's leading to our breakdown. And the breakdown is, is we constantly sacrifice the present for the future. Now, nah, I'm gonna get, when I get there, I know it's all gonna be worth it when I get there. Do, is that really, is that gonna be the mantra of your life that peace is over there? Like, we're all here tonight, but how many of you know that, that we're not all here? Does it make sense? Like, like we're, we're here, but just because you're here doesn't mean you're here. Some of you are here right now and you're thinking about the fact that the dolphins are now 0 and 5. You're like, I can't believe it. I don't know why it's surprising to you. You have too much faith. That's your problem. <laughs> Some of you, you're here right now, but you're already, your mind is already in scheduling mode for Monday. Who do I got to meet with? What do I got to do? The kids got to iron their clothes. I got to get their lunches put together. You're here, but you're not here. You're present, but you're not engaged. It's like, have you ever been on an elevator before? Just wave your at me. Have you ever been on an elevator? Nine of us, come on, a few more, come on. An elevator, like, have you ever thought about like the genius of an elevator? Like, it's awesome. You hit a button, a door opens up, you walk in, you stand in a box, the door is closed, you hit a number, and then you begin to levitate towards that floor. I don't know if you know this, but before the elevator, you actually had to take the stairs. You had to climb a ladder. You had to put physical effort in front of yourself. You should get on an elevator and go, thank God. God is good. I used to have to climb. Now I can elevate. Yet, you ever notice that nobody's happy on an elevator? What's up with that? Nobody. You can put 15 people shoulder to shoulder in an elevator. And everybody's doing the same thing. You ever notice that everybody faces the doors? They're like. Nobody talks. Nobody looks at each other. Just ahead. I want to challenge you tomorrow on Monday. You're not normal. You don't abide by the rules of this world. You're a follower of Jesus. You go to Voo Church. Tomorrow, when you get on the elevator, I want you to do something. I want you to hit the button. When the door opens up, I don't want you to face the doors. I just want you to face all those people. <laughs> this is pretty awesome. We're on an elevator. God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. Hey. You want to freak some people out? Face them in the elevator. If you're really dangerous, if you're really, you know, radical, hit floor three. When the door opens up, you got to be in shape for this. Go to the stairwell, run up to, to level five, go back to the elevator, hit the up arrow. When the doors open up, say, hey, you were talking about me, weren't you? You will freak some people out on a Monday. It's just the power of getting engaged in the moment. Wake up. The power is right here, right now. You see, peace is only found in the present. Peace is not a tomorrow thing or yesterday. It's, it's a right now. The power is here right now. It's here. It's here. Are you, are you restless tonight? Are you, are you weary? Are you anxious? Are you depressed? Are you, are you struggling? Well, because our desire is infinite and because you're finite, the challenge that we have is that anything less than God will leave us dissatisfied. You were meant to live with him forever. That's why you find yourself in such a dissatisfied place because those things can't fulfill what they promised to fulfill you. So Jesus, he would counsel you tonight and he would say, you know what you should do? You should take all of your desire and put it onto God because desire is infinite, but so is God. Therefore, God becomes the solution. It's this truth really isn't my truth, but rather in 300 AD, St. Augustine, these were his words and listen to how relevant they are tonight. He said, you have made for us, for yourself, 
You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. For the next few weeks, we're going to begin to look at different ways that we can find peace and we can find rest in the stress of life. But I thought tonight, we can't start and we can't end without first talking about Jesus. Because Jesus speaks right to you and I and he, in Matthew chapter 11, this is what he's speaking to. He's speaking to the restless soul. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and in me you will find rest for my burden is light and my yoke is easy. There's four words that stand out to me that tonight I wanna teach you as we are on this journey, as we begin this collection called Restless, because there's many people in this room that you would say, I'm working harder, I'm doing more, I have more money, I got the job I finally want, I'm finally dating the guy that I've always looked for, I finally have the friends I wanna be around, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Maybe it's because you're being driven by desire rather than steering your desire. Four words, come, take, learn, find. Come, take, learn, find. Everyone say come. come. Everyone say take. take. Everyone say learn. learn. Everyone say find. find. Jesus begins and he says this. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. The first word that sticks out is this word, come. This is good news for everyone in this room because Jesus is beginning his message and he's making a great invitation. Hey, are you stressed? Are you depressed? Are you burned out? Are you hurting? Are you anxious? Well, then come to me. You're invited to my party. <laughs> this is good news because anybody who would sit on the sidelines and be a naysayer of the Christian faith and simply call it just positive thinking or simply self-help jargon, they obviously haven't read the words of Jesus because Jesus does not ignore your hurts and hangups. Instead, he invites you to find freedom from your hurts and from your hangups. Come on, somebody, go ahead and give him praise tonight. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened. What's the catch, Rich? Here's the catch. You just have to respond to his invite. It's like Don Shrew and I, we, we love throwing parties at our house and we love hosting people in our home. And it's funny, you know, you throw a great party, you gotta start planning stuff, you gotta prepare things, you gotta get the food ready, you gotta clean your house to the point that it looks like your life is perfect on Instagram. You get the whole thing. <laughs> But after you've done all this preparation, what do you do? You send out an invite. I don't know what you use, paperless post, hobnob, Instagram, TikTok, WhatsApp, all sorts of you know, avenues out there. It doesn't matter. But once you send the invite, how many of you know, it doesn't matter how much prep, it doesn't matter how good the party is going to be. If the person doesn't come, then there's no power. It's the response to the invitation. What is your role? Your role is you simply have to come. He's inviting you. You ever have that, that friend in your life or that family member in your life? I've heard you guys say this before, but it's like, yo, if I could just get them in the room at Vu, if I could get them to just experience this place, if I could just get them to come, if they would just come once, just once, I, I know that God could do something in your life. I, I know if you could just come, you would finally realize I'm not crazy. <laughs> or you would see I'm not fully crazy. <laughs> It's like for me on Sunday mornings, I, I go to the gym and I come back home, I start going over my message and then I have a list of invites that I just send out every week just to people that are, that are not a part of our community, that I love here in Miami, that I want to be a part of what God is doing here and I know that they need a home. And last week I was writing this guy and his response, he goes, oh man, to be honest with you, Rich, yo, if I came to your church, your church would burn down, bro. You say, well, what does he mean? What, what he meant from my invitation is as I invited him, his response was, I'm not worthy to be in your church. His response was, I, I, I don't belong in a faith gathering. If you really knew the real me, if you knew the stuff I've done, am doing, going to do, want to do, desire to do, you would not be inviting me. Yet Jesus would say, yes, I would. Because the broken thinking is this, the broken thinking that even people in this room right now, you keep saying, I gotta clean myself up. 
I got to quit smoking. I got to quit drinking. I got to quit sleeping with my girlfriend. I got to quit looking at that. I got to quit doing that stuff over there. And once I get myself right, then I'm worthy to come to Jesus. But Jesus would say, you got the order out of order. You can't clean yourself. You got to come to me and I got to clean you up. I'm the one who's going to do the work. I'm the one who's going to do a work in your life. I'm the one who's going to set you on the right path. Come on, somebody. Anybody grateful for the invitation of God? Come to me. Simply come to me. Your job is to respond. God's job is to repair. Come and he will clean you up. Come and he will fix you. Come and he will start a work inside of you. So what is the point? The point is tonight is that you got to get real with God. Dude, I can share everything I got for the next four weeks, but if you're going to sit there and not admit that you're not okay, none of it matters. Jesus is not embarrassed by you. He's excited about you. Some of you think, oh man, my fatigue or my negative emotions, that disqualifies me from being around Jesus. Jesus would say, it's the opposite. I actually came for you. And I love this. I don't know if you see it, but he says, come to me and I will give you rest. Notice the emphasis is on him. Now this is very, very different from the self-help section at Barnes and Noble. Not against the self-help section at Barnes and Noble, but the self-help section at Barnes and Noble always comes down to list. If you do these 23 things, 23 things, if you do them, then you can be happy. Jesus is like, we don't need 23 things. You got to simply come to me and I will do the rest. I will do the work. I will give you rest. The focus is on him. Going to church is not coming to Jesus. Getting your worship playlist in the car is not, is not coming to Jesus. Th those are great supplements. But Jesus says, now you gotta actually bring that stuff right to me, to the source. Because when you come to Jesus, let me tell you what, you're gonna find real purpose. When you come to Jesus, you're gonna find real joy. You're gonna find real satisfaction. You're gonna find real purpose. You're gonna find a real destiny. You're gonna find the real rest that you've been looking for. Jesus doesn't offer you like a nap. He's not like, hey, vacation. It, it, he, he's offering you something far deeper than a nap, a pay raise, a vacation. He's offering your soul rest. He's saying you can steer your desire. Your desire doesn't have to drive you, but it must begin with you saying, oh, I'll respond to the invitation. Come. He doesn't stop there. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burden. I will give you rest. Watch this second word, take take my yoke upon you. Everyone say, take. take. Now this is fascinating because unless you were living in the first century and hearing this, um, it, it probably doesn't have, uh, it probably doesn't have the weight for us in 2019 as it did for them. The reason why is because we, we, we forget what a yoke is. We've explained it here before, but a yoke is a wooden object that's put on two animals uh, the two animals then, as they have these wooden objects over their shoulder, they're able to do work together. Typically, they plow a field in tandem. They work and they make the effort of the work becomes easier as they do it together. So for us, we don't use yokes. We live in Miami. It's 2019. But for those people back then, they would have been going, wait a minute. Jesus, are you offering us rest or are you offering us work? In fact, some of you tonight are like, yo, bro, <laughs> I didn't come for another job. Like I got four and I can, I barely pay the bills. I, I don't need more work. That, that's why I am restless. So, so what's the point of what Jesus is saying? The point of what Jesus is saying is he wants you to ask the question. The question being, what is the work that God is talking about that will lead to soul rest? Well, Jesus answers his own question. John chapter six, verse 29. What does Jesus say? He says, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent. So I don't know if you've ever heard of this before, but the work of a Christian is simply to believe in Jesus. You want to know how you work for God? You believe in Jesus. Jesus said in John 15, verse four, he said, abide in me. What is our work? Our work is to believe and abide in Jesus. 
I believe in what Jesus said. I believe in what Jesus did. And I am abiding in him. I am taking his yoke. I'm yoking my life up next to his. And I believe that he's got a mission and a purpose. And together he will lead me to where he wants to take me. You see, the result of abiding and believing is always obedience. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. Um, this past week, my, my, my iPhone started messing up. I don't know what it is. Like, I don't want to be a hater on Apple, but this is just my experience. Um, whenever they introduce a new product, all the old products start going bad, you know? It's a mystery. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> and so it was a rough week for me. I have an iPhone 10, and my face ID recognition, it went out. Can you believe that? It's like, oh my goodness, I have passwords. It's, it's difficult. My thumbs were dying. It was crazy. <laughs> Tough life. Um, pray for me this week, if you don't mind. Um, nonetheless, you get used to that face ID, you know, and it just opens. But, but it wasn't working. And so I, I decided I would go to the Apple store, which is always a blessing. And um, <laughs> I got in and I was, I was talking to one of the workers there and um, they pulled up my account. They said, oh, good news, Rich you have 11 days left on your warranty. I said, there is a God somewhere. <laughs> and she started doing some more research and she said, well, here's the deal. Your phone is actually broken on the inside. The hardware is broken. And because of it, and because you're under warranty, um, we're gonna actually replace your phone. But we're not just gonna replace your phone with an iPhone 10. Really good news. We're gonna replace your, your, your phone with an iPhone 11. I said, God is good to his son. I got a new iPhone 11, baby, replacement. Um, after about four hours of being there, um, <laughs> you've been. Um, I was left with two phones. I had an iPhone 10 and an iPhone 11. And the gentleman finished the work and I grabbed both the phones and I started to walk out of the store. And the gentleman said, no, no Rich, Rich, Rich. I said, yeah, he goes, he goes no, 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 we replaced your phone. You got to leave the old phone and take the new phone. I said, I, I said, I don't, I thought they were both mine. He said, no, 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 no. We replaced the old with the new. And you can only leave here with one phone. So if you want the old phone, you got to leave the new phone. But if you want the new phone, you're going to have to leave the old one. Are you following what I'm saying? The cross of Jesus Christ was the great exchange of yokes <laughs> where Jesus said, I'm gonna take your yoke of shame, condemnation, and guilt, and I'm gonna give you a new yoke. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. But here's the catch. You can't carry both yokes. If you want the new, you gotta leave the old. Come on, somebody give him praise tonight. Take what he has for you. Take his yoke. What's the work? The work is believe and abide. I believe you, Jesus. I believe you are who you said that you are. I'm abiding in you. The result is I'm gonna obey you. I'm walking in step with you. I don't want my old yoke. I want the new yoke. I can't have both. I gotta leave one to step into the other. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Maybe it's because you've still yet to take his yoke. Jesus says, come. He says, take. But watch this, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. This third word is this word learn. Everyone say learn. learn. The word learn indicates to you and I that there is a process to becoming like Jesus. Yeah. Salvation is in a moment. Justification happens in a moment. But then the process of sanctification, the becoming like Jesus, it's gonna take us learning how he lived his life. That's why when we're reading the scriptures, we shouldn't just pay attention to what he said. We should pay attention to what he did. You should watch him. You should discover the nuance of his life. How did he behave? How did he operate? What was his common way about going through life? As you watch his life, you begin to be discipled. You become a Jesus apprentice because you're living and acting like Jesus. That's what we're after here. That's why you come on Sundays is because we're trying to leave here walking, thinking, talking, behaving like Jesus. 
One of the most fascinating things to me, and you can study it a little bit and you can come back and give me your feedback if you see something different, but I can't find anywhere in the four gospels that Jesus is in a hurry. Like Jesus operates from a place of rest. Like just, like no, he's never panicked. We never see Jesus sprinting. We never see him on a horse galloping. Let's go. That's not what he's doing. He's not concerned with being late. I mean, one of the benefits of inventing time is that you can never be late, but um, he's not bothered. In fact, watch this. It's like every one of the miracles that we see in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I think, I won't, I won't put you into this. I'll put myself. For me, if I was Jesus, every one of those moments, I would have perceived them to be interruptions. Like, because notice, Jesus doesn't have like an iPhone calendar. He's not like, okay, let me see what's going on today. 11 a.m., heal Lazarus. Okay. Um, 12, walk on water. Uh, 2 p.m., I'm going to turn water to wine. Hey, turn up. He's not doing that. No, as he's going through life, that which you and I would call an interruption, many times he behaves like it's an invitation. He doesn't react, he responds. Why is it? I believe it's this. I believe it's because when you're restless, you react. You know what a reaction is, right? What? What'd you say to me? Not today. It's a reaction. But watch this. When you're rested, you respond. What is response? Response is the ability to choose. The response is, I'm above the noise. I'm above the chaos. I'm not behaving according to my feelings. I have responsibility, the ability to respond. I was thinking this week, um, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard of like, you know, the ERT, the emergency response team. Like if you call 911, someone picks up, that's the ER, that's the emergency response team. Their job is to respond. Oh my God, my house is on fire. Okay, sir, are you in the house? No, no, I'm not. Okay, sir, get out of the house. I'm not in the house. Okay, out of the house. Is there anybody else in the house? No, my kids are with me. Okay, take them to the sidewalk, get away from the smoke. Ah, but my house is on fire. I know, go to the sidewalk. There's help on the way. Everything's gonna be okay. We're on the way to you. Please calm down, sir. Everything's fine. That's the emergency response team. Can you imagine if it was the emergency react team? on fire. My house is on. Oh no. God, no. Oh no. This is an awful day. Jenny, Rich's house is on fire. (laughs) One of the simplest ways you can define if you're rested or if you're restless is are you reacting? Are you responding? Are you reacting or are you responding? Because God's actually placed you in situations and he's looking for the emergency response team, but you're the emergency react team. And you just throw fuel on every fire that comes your way. You thought it was an interruption to your life, but Jesus was actually saying, no, if you would rest in me and if you would learn from me, you would respond and you would see the invitation for a miracle to take place. Watch how Eugene Peterson says this. This is so beautiful. Eugene Peterson, he translates Matthew 11, verse 28. This is how he says, he says, are you tired? Yeah. Worn out? Yeah. Burned out on religion? Heck yeah. Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn, watch this, the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. How many could use some more freely and lightly in your life? I could. I like it how Eugene says it that way. He says, learn the, the unforced rhythms of grace. Life is not about balance. Life is about rhythm. Seasons come, seasons go. 
you must define your season so you can determine your rhythm. Rhythms change. This Thursday, we're going to have a second boy. Believe me, the rhythm of my house is going to change. But I don't panic and I don't freak out. No, 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 no. I set myself up for a a new rhythm. The rhythm of grace. What's the rhythm of grace? Jesus is grace in the flesh. We should learn from his life. Pay attention to what he did. There's many things I want to unpack over the next few weeks, but but one thing that is clear to me, how is Jesus able to operate from such a place of rest? I think we are being silly and ignorant if we don't pay attention to the fact that Jesus believed in and honored the Sabbath. If I'm being honest with you for the next three weeks, I'm going to challenge myself and challenge our church in a brand new way around this subject. Sabbath is a word that we discover, but it, it really comes from the Hebrew word Shabbat. Maybe you've heard this word before, but, but Shabbat simply means to stop. Sabbath is not a day off. Sabbath is a moment to stop. Why do I stop? I stop so I can focus and confess God's love. I stop so I can remind myself of God's love. Why? Because perfect love drives out all fear. God's love is the antidote to the fear that's driving many of you. But do you know why I stop? I stop so I can curb the appetite of my desire and put it into check. I'm stopping to say, God, I'm trusting you with six days rather than trusting myself with seven days. God, I trust that you can fill in the gap. God, I I trust that you can make up the moments that I cease and that I stop because I can't keep up with the rat race and I can't keep up with all of these things that are changing and I'm busy and I'm nonstop and that's the problem. I'm nonstop and I can't hear you. I'm so distracted. I'm never engaged. I'm always here, but I'm never there and I'm I'm struggling because I'm restless. And God's going, why don't you give me one day that you stop? Not a day off. Have you noticed that on your day off, really we all say a day off is the day that we do all the work that we don't get paid for. (laughs) Sabbath is deeper than that. It's stopping. And Jesus believed in it and he honored it, meaning he adhered to the Sabbath. We could sit here and talk all day long. Man, he never ran, man. We could preach, make you laugh, but maybe there was something different about the rhythm of his life. It's amazing because this idea of Sabbath, it's really, it's really like established in the very beginning of the Bible, like Genesis chapter two. I'll show it to you in a couple of weeks, but God, he's creating. Remember there's seven days of creation. On the sixth day, watch this. He, he creates man from the dirt he makes Adam. The seventh day, the scripture says that God rested. Let me say it one more time. The seventh day, God rested. That should just stop all of us in our tracks. And, hello, if God chose to rest, why do I think I can get through this life without resting? If God decided that rest was important, why do I think rest is unimportant? Why do I hashtag no days off? Why do I hashtag hustle hard? (laughs) Maybe because I'm trusting myself rather than trusting God. But here's a beautiful picture. I've never seen this before. Man was created on the sixth day. God rested on the seventh day. Watch this. Man was created on the sixth day. Man's first day on the earth was a day of rest. That God said, you're going to start from a place of rest. You're not going to work to rest. You're going to rest so you can work. Friend, this is a picture of the gospel in the very first two chapters of the Bible. For the gospel is good news. Some of you in this room, you still have not believed in the good news. You believe in fake good news. Your fake good news is if I work really hard and if I keep striving, one day I'm going to have the life I always dreamed. One day I'm going to finally be at peace. But Jesus would say unto you, no, learn from my life. Watch the rhythm of my life. You can start in peace and out of peace you can move into work. You're loved right where you are. You don't have to earn God's love. God loves you right now, today, right as you are. He loves you, and because he loves you, now you can respond, and you can fulfill the mission, the purpose that he has for your life, but it comes out of a place of rest, security, confidence. Come. Take. Take. Learn. Last Sunday night, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. 
Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. Watch this. And you will find, everyone say find. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The last word is the word find. The last word is the word find. If you'll come to Jesus, if you'll respond to his invitation, if you'll take the new yoke and get rid of the old yoke, if you'll learn from his life and watch his life, the result is you're gonna find what you've been looking for. I know you think you know what you're looking for. I know you think that if you could marry him or her, that would bring you peace. I know you think if you could go on that vacation or go to that school or get that job. I know you think if you had that group of friends. I know you think that if life looked that way, then you would find, finally find satisfaction. But it's not true. What you've been looking for is Jesus. What you've been looking for is soul rest. But the very fact that it says the word find makes me believe that it's not just always blatantly obvious to discover. In fact, watch as the writer of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter four, watch this. There, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort, everyone say effort, make every effort to enter that rest. That scripture tells me that if I'm ever going to adhere and believe in the Sabbath, it's going to require effort. The reason why a lot of us don't rest is because our life is undisciplined. The reason why a lot of us in this room, we don't give financially to God, is not because you don't believe in it. It's because your finances are undisciplined. Jesus is saying, get your life into margin and watch as you get your life under control how you'll start to have peace in your mind, peace in your body. The scripture says you got to make every effort to keep the Sabbath. That it's going to require discipline. It's going to require an effort. It's not just blatantly obvious. It's, it's amazing. You ever had a situation where you had the answer, but you didn't know you had the answer? When I first moved to Miami, um, 1998, I was 14 years of age. <laughs> My parents, we moved from Tacoma, Washington to Miami. Miami was this big, huge city for us. We were like, this is crazy. And we were living in Sunny Isles area. And I was going to school in Miami Lakes. And when we first got there, somebody showed us this route that we would cross the bridge on A1A to, to Federal Highway, to US-1. And then we would drive all the way north to Hallandale Beach Boulevard, take Hallandale Beach Boulevard west to I-95 south, take 95 south all the way to the Palmetto, Palmetto to Miami Lakes. Now, if you live in Miami and you know the roads here, you know that is crazy. <laughs> you don't go north to go south. And for six months, don't judge me. We didn't have an iPhone. We were using treasure maps, okay? <laughs> for six months, we were adding 20 plus minutes onto our drive. I'll never forget the first time someone finally said, yo, um, you know there's a better way, right? It was for me in that moment at 14 years of age, like God parting the Red Sea. I was like, God, you're a miracle working God. 20 new minutes, you know. But friends, it wasn't a miracle. It was simply me discovering a new route, a better way that always existed. I wonder tonight, could it be, could it be that you're not steering your desires, but rather your desires are driving you. And could it be that you have taken the route of the world? Could it be that you've been listening to the advice and the counsel of the world's system? And could it be tonight that if you would simply take the counsel, if you would simply take the counsel and the route of the gospel, you would discover there's a better way. There's a way that you can find real rest, soul rest. That you could find yourself saying, I finally found what I'm looking for. My soul. My soul is at rest. Stuff is going on around me, but my, my soul is at rest. I'm not waiting for tomorrow to make me happy. I'm happy right now. I'm not waiting for peace to begin. I got peace 
right now. But bro, you're in the middle of some chaos. I know, but that's the wonder working power of our God that he promises me peace that surpasses all understanding. I finally found what I'm looking for. A better way. Come, take, learn, find. Say it with me. Say, come, take, learn, find. One more time. Come, take, learn, find. If you believe that tonight, can you go ahead and give Jesus a big round of applause on this room?